was originally published back in 1619 by Johannes Kepler, an astronomer who had poured over or lots and lots and lots of data which uh, other astronomers had collected. Uh, and so he, in, in observing all of this data and doing some observations of his own, he was able to make some conclusions about the orbits of objects around other celestial objects. So in this case, we're gonna take a look at something simple like the Earth going around the sun. Kepler actually looked at four moons of Jupiter and some of the data from that. Uh, but, but we'll be able to take a look at this. And what Kepler did in, in observing all of this data was he found there was a relationship between the period of an orbiting object and its radius from the central object which it was orbiting. So what we're gonna go through and do is we're going to derive the relationship which Kepler found between period and radius. Now what's interesting to note of all this is that Kepler actually didn't do the physics which we're gonna do here today. Uh, Kepler looked at lots and lots of data, did lots and lots of math, uh, but he actually didn't have the tools in order to do this basic derivation which we're gonna work out. Um, what we're gonna do in order to work through this is we're gonna look at what's called Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation, which didn't come out until almost 70 years after this. Uh, Newton's laws didn't come out or weren't published until 1687. Uh, and so Kepler was actually quite a ways ahead of Newton chronologically. Uh, and so he came up with this relationship between period and radius, which we're gonna derive, uh, but it actually couldn't be derived with math until much later when Newton came along. So let's take a look at this, not as Kepler did by looking at tables and tables of data, but let's look at this as Newton would have. Now to do that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at what forces are in fact keeping this object in orbit around this other central object. Now, there was a lot of debate back in this period of time in the 1600s as to what in fact was keeping things or objects in orbit around central objects like the sun. Uh, Newton came along, proposed the theory of universal gravitation, and eventually that was, that was proven to be true. And so we're gonna look at this and realize, much as Newton did, that the only force acting on this object as it orbits around, in this case, the sun, is gravity. And that force by gravity is acting radially inward. So as this mass moves around, the only thing acting on this mass, this could be the Earth if we want it to be, is gonna be gravity acting inward. So if there's any tangential velocity, call it V, that velocity is never going to change or the magnitude of that velocity is never going to change. Its direction will. And it's important to realize that this force by gravity is acting centripetally. It'll never change the magnitude of velocity because these are at a right angle to each other, since we're saying this is a circular orbit. If there wasn't a circular orbit, there would be a slight change or a large change in velocity as this object went around in an elliptical orbit. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but our derivation is gonna be based entirely on a perfectly circular orbit, which incidentally, the Earth has a very nearly perfectly circular orbit. Um, it only varies by a few hundred thousand miles. So, nearly circular. Uh, so, with this, uh, what we're going to start out with is centripetal force. And we need to realize that in this case, since we have something going in a circle, the centripetal force is in fact the force by gravity. We can expand each of these terms, centripetal force being mv squared over r. Now it's important to recognize this mass is in fact the mass of our orbiting body, not the central object here. And the force by gravity between them, the mutual attraction due to gravity, is going to be g, the gravitational constant, times the product of their two masses over the distance between them, squared. And incidentally, a little bit of cancellation happens right away here. You see the radius partially cancels out. And the really important thing to recognize is the mass of our orbiting object right here goes away. So whether we're talking about something small like a man-made satellite or something large like a, a planet or even an entire 
solar system or a star, uh, this mass cancels out, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so the mass goes away, which means we don't really care what the mass of that object is. And you'll see that has some pretty big consequences later on when we start looking at how Kepler's law was applied. Now realize, we've interjected the velocity of an object into this problem. Uh, all Kepler was able to look at really was the period of an object and relate that back to its radius. Uh, and so he wasn't able to sit there and measure directly the velocity of an object. And you might say, okay, well, if he knew period and radius, couldn't he just back into the velocity? And the answer is sort of, I'll get to that. We know that velocity is two pi r over period. That is for an object moving in a circle, its circumference is gonna be two pi r. So that's the total tangential distance traveled. And the period being the time for one full revolution goes right here. So we have tangential distance traveled over the time for a, a full revolution gives us velocity. And so pretty quickly, we can sub this in here. Uh, don't forget to square this as you go. Four pi squared, r squared over t squared is gm over r. And we're just gonna go a little bit farther with this. Uh, the tendency is for people to wanna cancel out an r here and an r there, and that is just completely wrong. Uh, so we'll be careful in pulling this over here. This gets us to This. And I'm going to rearrange this just a little bit differently for reasons that are not fully apparent to you just yet, and that's okay. To arrive at this. This is as we now in modern times see it as, as Kepler's third law. Uh, back in his day, this was shown a little bit different. It didn't include the gravitational constant or the central mass, but what he did recognize was there's this relationship between period and radius. This squared cubed relationship, which shows up all over the place in, in science, not just in physics or astrophysics. It also shows up in nature in lots of weird places. Um, but it showed up here, the squared cubed relationship. And so if, if the radius increased, the period would increase according to these proportions. This term right here is of great consequence for us now. Now that we can derive this using Newton's law of universal gravitation right here, this is really important and we can see why this was so useful and so impactful uh, way back in Kepler and then Newton's day. If we look at, say, for example, the solar system, whether we're dealing with Earth or one of the other planets, say Mars, which would be out about here. Um, everything right here in these parentheses is the same because in the case of our solar system, we're always talking about the mass of the sun, okay? Now I'm not gonna write S right here, but uh, I want you to think about this. If this was the sun right here, no matter what planet we're talking about, everything in these parentheses would be the same. And so Kepler uh, was, was a little bit clever. He understood there was a constant here and he didn't understand quite what made up that constant. He wasn't sure what the gravitational constant was or what the mass of the sun was. He didn't even have any idea what it was that was influencing these values. But what he was able to see was that for every object orbiting the sun, this value was the same. And so what he was able to do was look through lots and lots of data and find this squared cubed relationship. Later on when Newton came along, they were able to go through and actually figure out what was going on here. Now, the actual value for the mass of the sun, even Newton didn't know. They weren't sure of the actual distance to the sun. So what they did was a little bit clever. They went through and they said the radius from the sun to the earth was one astronomical unit. Okay, that simply being the sun-earth distance. Newton didn't know what that was. His contemporaries didn't know what that was. There was a very tough time figuring out exactly how far it was from the sun to the earth. That took quite a while. But if they put in a value here for a radius of one and a period of one year, the way the units work out in here, ultimately for the earth, this would work out to be one. And so then in observing other planets, 
knowing their periods, even though they couldn't directly measure the radius, knowing the periods of those planets, uh, they were able to go through and figure out exactly how far away the planets were from the sun. So for example, they were able to see the period of Mercury was such that they were able to calculate the radius of Mercury's orbit was roughly 0.38 AUs, roughly a third of the distance between the sun and the earth. Um, and, and they were able to work that out for all the planets. So all of a sudden, Kepler had, had recognized this pattern it was ultimately able to put the planets in order because before that, people couldn't do that. They had no idea what order the planets were in uh, it's simply because it's hard to tell distance through a simple telescope. Later on, because of Newton's contributions and his law of universal gravitation, this uh, term right here started to be a little bit more understood um, and people were starting to able, be able to figure out exactly uh, just you know how big the sun is from, from basic things like this. So. Unlike many of the derivations that we do on this channel, where things are maybe a little bit contrived just to put some, some, you know, young physics learner through a little bit of trauma as they work their way through physics to, to understand the basics and the concepts of what's going on, realize this derivation was actually extremely important and extremely impactful uh, when it first appeared, uh, because it really brought a lot of understanding to science and the scientific community, uh, this was cutting edge and allowed people to understand just what was going on in the universe, where beforehand there was lots of question and lots of misunderstanding as to what it was that was going on and why things were remaining in orbit around the sun. So, that is Kepler's third law. And that's all for now.